All right, well, welcome. I'm glad that you could all make it on this cold and rainy day. Um, my name is Mike Munger. This is a meeting of the Theory Colloquium and the Hayek Seminar Series sponsored by the Thomas W. Smith Foundation. So thanks to both of those groups. Um, our speaker for today is someone I have known and admired for quite some time, John Tomasi of Brown University. He is the founder and current director of the Political Theory Project, a remarkably successful enterprise that's changed the intellectual atmosphere in a number of ways at Brown University. And I'm proud of John. I hope he's proud of his own achievements there. It really is something pretty significant. Uh, he's going to talk today about his relatively new and still uh, in some ways quite controversial book, Free Market Fairness. Um, John, it, political science is perhaps the most ecumenical of disciplines because I'm an economist by training. At least I was catechized in that before I left the church. <laughs> and John was catechized as a philosopher, um, although he's still welcome in political science. But for the two of us to meet in a political science seminar, is quite remarkable. And John's work here spans a number of different fields. And I think there's something in it to either challenge or provoke almost everyone who reads it. So please welcome John Tomas. Good afternoon. Thanks, thanks for coming. Thanks to my uh, firm for inviting me. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I am in a political science department and a philosophy department, but I think of myself as a political philosopher. And what I'm going to do now is going to roll some philosophy on you. Um, I'm aware that it's you know whatever time it is, late in the afternoon, and um, I would just promise you that I'm going to roll philosophy on you in a, in a way that will be gentle and not painful. At least will not be painful to you unless you walk in here and are sitting there now having a political philosophy. And if you have a political philosophy and still yourself start to feel pain as I begin to speak, do not be alarmed for what is pain. <laughs> it's merely weakness leaving the body. <laughs> so for many years, uh, 30, <laughs> for, many, for many years, 30 years, 40 years, the train of liberal philosophizing has lain in a deep freeze. The divide among the philosophers, professional political philosophers, mirrors a divide in, um, in, um, in, the, po in the popular politics of many Western liberal constitutional democracies, a divide between parties of left and of right. And as I think of the divide among the philosophers, among the uh, philosophers and political theorists, that divide, that ideological divide, um, resembles a frozen cove with one group off one coast and the other group off the other coast, a frozen, desolate expanse in between, wind blowing little tufts of snow, not much communication goes across the, the divide. Off one coast, um, we have, this again, the academic side, there's the embattled camp of the classical liberals and libertarians. And this has for a long time been my group, at least for many years, was my, was my, my, uh, my band. And uh, these are people who, as I picture them, are hunkered down on the ice uh, in their tents. The wind's blowing pretty hard against the door, flapping it around. But they got these stakes that, that they've had for a long time, time stakes like the principle of self-ownership that it hammered deep into the ice long ago. And though the wind will blow, those tents are going nowhere. And part of being in that tent, uh, in those tents and that, 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 that encampment, is a certain pride in being the embattled ones. And I, I know that pride, I, as I said, I've been there. In that camp, um, is the, these are people who defend limited government, uh, strong private economic liberties. And in that camp, the phrase social justice is only rarely or dismissively heard. This is the intellectual camp that gives firepower, I suppose, to popular movements like the American Tea Party. Across the windswept divide, on the other side of the frozen expanse, is the academically dominant camp. This is the camp of the material or egalitarian, or as Sam Freeman likes to call them, the high liberals. And I'm going to give them high liberals because it suggests, you know, fighting for a ball. <laughs> this is, I said, the academically dominant camp. And instead of tents, you know, I sort of think of them as being, you know, an igloos. Igloos blocked together mainly by the sky. 
and you all know John Rawls. It's a, in that camp, there's heaters, I suppose. There's furs and the igloos. It's comfortable in there. They're faux furs, but they're furs. Um, it's the camp that you know most political philosophers uh, reside within. If you, if you throw a snowball down the hallway of any major political philosophy program in the country, you're pretty likely you could hit a high liberal outside the head. In this camp, in the camp of the high liberals, their battle cry is social justice. And they advocate in various ways a government of expansive powers, especially in economic affairs, in pursuit of the requirements of social justice. And in this camp, people are skeptical or about economic liberty. Or if they're capitalists, they are, they are only reluctantly so, as Ronald Dworkin um, once said. This is the academic camp that gives firepower and sustenance, intellectual sustenance, to popular movements such as Occupy Wall Street. Here's a little touch now for philosophy, a little metaphor, a touch of philosophy. Not much, right? And so as I think of it, the, the important point that I want to point your attention to is that that divide between the two camps, the political divide between those commitments I mentioned, economic liberty, not social justice, social justice, but skeptical of economic liberty, that political difference is rooted in a philosophical dispute, ultimately, I think, about the nature of moral personality. So if you can this in different ways, this is the way I think of it. Most, most philosophical views begin with something like a conception of society or a conception of moral personality. Philosophers sort of reason out in more, more or less self-conscious ways from an, a, a view about what human nature is like, a moral view about how we should begin thinking about politics, and they reason out from those premises out in different ways, different kinds of reasoning to different political conclusions. And so, for example, the divide I just mentioned, these two categories at top are kind of the ten people, and these are the, you know, the, the igloo, the igloo crowd. So, for example, by libertarians, I mean, um, I mean people like um, Robert Nozick, I suppose. Um, um, and the, and the, this, this view, these are people who affirm very strong economic liberties. They are, they, they affirm economic liberties as, in some sense, moral absolutes. They allow very little room for the state, if any at all. They are, that's a tradition that I see rooted, broadly speaking, in, in a Lockean conception of politics. I mean, there's variations, but roughly Lockean. And on that view, familiar view to many of you, of course, the idea of a, a self-owner, the people own themselves, and you know the Lockean argument, you own yourself, you own your labor, own your labor, you can mix it with things in the world, you can come to own those things. And on that tradition, broadly speaking, many of the people in that view argue naturalistically out to a conception of what the state should be like, given from the premises about self-ownership. And from self-ownership, most liberals following, most libertarians following the Lockean idea think that when it comes time to decide what the state should be like, one of the important things the state should do, maybe the most important thing the state should do, is to protect these natural rights of, of, of ownership, and you get something like the libertarian politics. There's variations, and that, I mentioned the tenth people is more than one tenth. Another broader tradition is, is classical liberal, which I think of as being a, a, a utilitarian or ends directed form of reasoning. They think of a person as a happiness maximizer or a utility seeker. They tend to be, these are people like um, Mises and perhaps Frederick Hayek. They'll be saying something about Hayek, but they can test that as I go. And they argue uh, through ends directed forms of reasoning out to a conception of economic liberty that's justified because of some idea that economic liberties have um, economic advantages, for example, in terms of certain kinds of efficiency. And that's a view of the classical liberal. They affirm strong economic liberties, like the libertarians do, but they tend to be less absolutist in their claims. One of the features about classical liberalism is that uh, classical liberals, such as Hayek in particular, uh, Milton Friedman also, they have, they have a lot of uh, built-in exceptions to times when they defend economic liberty, or at least a lot of, they, they find room for state activity in, a way that, in ways that libertarians find unprincipled, perhaps because they're based on consequentialist calculations. So on one side, on one post, we have this, the tent people, the classical liberals and libertarians. On the other side, a very different tradition, the tradition most famously associated with Rawls recently, but it's a tradition that I think was roughly um, Rousseauian. And on this broad <coughs> tradition, um, they think of they start, they have a different starting place. They think of the beginnings of politics as being not with thinking of the person as a self-owner or a happiness seeker, but something like a democratic citizen. And politics kind of begins from that idea. And the democratic citizen approach is I think of it as we think about politics, we begin, when we think about politics, we begin this way. We ask ourselves, well, 
what's a person like for purposes of political argumentation? And they suggest that the democratic citizen is a being with these two aspects. On the one hand, the democratic citizen is thought to be a being or a person who has a life to lead. And that life is incredibly important to that person. After it all, it is the life of that person. At the same time, though, on this broadly Rousseauian approach, people are also thought as having the capacity to recognize that each of their fellow citizens has a life to lead. And that life is incredibly important to each of them. When I speak to libertarian audiences, I always hasten to add that, that recognizing that second moral power, if you want to call it that, does not require that people now become slaves to one another. It's simply recognizing that in some way, you want to describe what a person is like to get politics going. On this approach, there's an insistence that we think about both these aspects that are familiar to us, perhaps. The aspect that we have our life to lead is really important, but so too that we can recognize that the people around us have lives to lead that matter too. I mention all that because if you see that, as I do, that, that these disputes here about politics are rooted in prior disputes, conceptually prior disputes, about moral philosophy. That helps to explain why the, the sea between the two camps long ago thickened and froze. Because to make progress on this stuff, you need to make progress on this stuff. And I first started seeing this sort of this rough uh, you know, sort of way of thinking about this sort of rough chart um, when I was a grad student. And I remember going with great enthusiasm to, um, especially when I went from Arizona to Oxford, with great enthusiasm. I was starting to see it a little bit then. I thought, wow, this is going to be great because I'm going to go to philosophers, really good philosophers, and we're going to figure out this. Like, what's the best way to begin? But I noticed pretty early on, even in my naivete, that when we started having those conversations, or any time we, became, we began to have these conversations about these starting places, people were all, we, were, we were all aware as participants that whoever won here was likely to win there. So these philosophical conversations tended to be infected systematically with a background awareness that when you start here, you're probably going to push down that way. Most obviously perhaps on these two, these prior two about libertarianism. So there's a, there's, it was hard to get at the philosophical debate because we, in the background of our minds, we knew that there were politically, the, the, the philosophical questions were politically loaded, and the outcomes were going to run us off one way, one way or the other. And um, I guess some of you are grad students, I, I gather, at least I know that for me, this divide uh, between this camp and this camp was most vivid to me when I was a graduate student. And I remember, as, as I said, you know, coming on the scene for the first time, starting to see what's the terrain of you know, political philosophy ideologically, and really being alarmed to discover that, in fact, there was this, tar this stark divide. Because I personally was quite drawn to some of the moral, very strongly drawn to some of the moral ideals of this camp. And I sort of realized, really well, that's, but that's not where the power lies in the academy. And people like me who were drawn to those ideas on the libertarian coast often found ourselves um, whisked off, mushed on, on dog sleds, and, and mushed over in that direction. Dog sleds supported paper by people like the Institute for Humane Studies, and kind of mushed over in that direction you know, to these little icy camps over there. And we said, we got close, we actually, we have to choose between, you know, um, Rothbard or some Nozick and Hayek. But there wasn't much choice within that. My, my other colleagues in grad school who were more drawn to the mainstream view found themselves on, you know, high-powered snow machines with heated leather seats up, up, up to the camps of the high liberals where they were warmly welcomed and, you know, head off on their various projects. The key bit, though, is that because of this divide, what's happened in the academy for a long time is that these people tend to speak with each other, and these people tend to speak with each other, especially this crowd and this crowd. And people organize conferences and have discussions, typically not across that divide, but within the various camps. And what we get is uh, a situation where there can, seems to be no middle ground, in part because, no middle ground here, in part because it's hard to see middle <coughs> ground here. And what we get then, just to finish what I call the moral status quo, is a set of stark choices, economic liberty or social justice, capitalism or democracy, uh, Rawls or Hayek, Hayek or Rawls, Tea Party or Occupy, free markets or fairness, one side or the other, everyone's got to choose. I don't like it. I haven't liked it for a long time. And what I do, what I do in, in my book, Free Market Fairness, is try to show a different way to think about these things. And what I do, you know, again, you know, metaphorically, is as a classical liberal, a person who's very strongly drawn to some of the moral ideas 
about the importance of private economic liberty, I basically eventually sort of grew up and bucked up and said that in fact, when I think about how I begin politics, this to me seems like a more morally powerful and appropriate starting place. So just putting aside the question of what that's going to stick you with, when I think about how I begin politics, this seems to me to be a more attractive place to, way to begin. And I also think that this is a more attractive way to proceed, a more attractive form of reasoning. But what I do is, starting over there with my 10 people, I take a few of these insights about economic liberty, some of these convictions about economic liberty, though I'm now going to start seeing them in a different way. I put them aboard a little icebreaker that I build in the book, and I chug across the divide. And when they get here, I bump hard into the igloos, gently, in peace, but hard and firmly. And I bump into the igloos and try to break up the ice beneath our feet. And my idea is then, as a fellow democratic theorist, to invite my fellow democratic theorists to join me in looking down at the pieces beneath our feet in perhaps new ways, and to ask ourselves questions that have not been asked because of some systematic biases, I think, among the groups we've been doing the deliberating in the past. And among the questions I ask are questions like these, uh, most loosely, is deliberative democracy really a vehicle that can only make left turns. Kind of strange, right? Why would we think that any time we deliberate and are committed to be respectful to one another, that we've got to do this every time? Why is that? It seems a little odd just on the face of it. More precisely, I ask this question of my fellow democratic citizens, uh, theorists. Do we really best respect our fellow citizens as free and equal authors of their own lives by seeking to use state power to limit their private economic liberties. Is that really the highest democratic form of living together? If you want to ask how it's possible that people can live together in a way that most fully and most adequately express their desire to respect each other as free and equal self-governing agents, would you really think that we should use the state to limit their private economic liberties? Or might we think something else about economic liberty? So I develop a, a count of, of social justice, oh, I'm sorry, this, I work out an account of social justice that I call market democracy and a particular version of it that I call free market fairness that seeks to combine the uncombinables. And it combines democracy and capitalism, Rawls and Hayek, Occupy and Tea Party, fairness and free markets. And again, so here's the schema. Uh, start up here, go down there from the same conception of the citizen, reason out this way but come to something that combines economic liberty and social justice. And I tried to lay, Jason Brennan and I, uh, last spring, tried to label it, neo, tried to label the school neoclassical liberal, which you know sounds neoconservative, people, people with this ugly name. About the time we tried to do that, the, the blog Bleeding Heart Libertarians began. Some of you may go there, it's a fantastic blog, and they sell t-shirts, and you, know, you, you can't compete with that label, so it's being called Bleeding Heart Libertarianism. I don't like that name, I think it is a classical liberal, but anyway, so that's the, that's, the, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm going to talk with you about. I'm going to talk with you about what this might mean. If we went, if we just took this basic structure to start with, and then we started reasoning this way, might we find, if we reason in a way that's open-minded about economic liberty and its importance, that it could be possible to build an account of social justice, which makes a central place to economic liberty, to private economic liberty. And to make that work, to actually build an account of neoclassical liberal justice, or what I call a market democratic interpretation of social justice, you need two things. First, you need a democratic argument for private economic liberty. Right? Because if I'm going to argue for economic liberty, strong economic liberties, it's powerful ones, I can't do it these ways. I've got to do it this way. So you need a democratic argument for economic liberty. Second, you also need, if you're committed to the idea, if you argue, if you argue deliberatively, and accept the idea that people have their lives to lead and that they can recognize their fellow citizens as having decided beings to have their lives to lead, you get drawn pretty quickly from those premises, I think correctly, as people on the left have long, long argued, towards an idea of something like um, uh, reciprocity or something like social justice. The idea that in a just society that really reflects our commitment to treat each other as free and equal self-governing agents, no class should be left behind. That is, you need something like any kind of social justice. So the second feature of my view that I need, I need a democratic argument for economic liberty, but I also need an, a, a theory of fair shares or an account of distributive justice that's compatible with affirming very powerful 
negative, uh, very po powerful private economic liberties. And just the obvious challenge of that is that, I mean, to take it out of philosophy and then just do it within you know, politics, if you tie the hand, strong economic liberties look like they're going to tie the hands of well-meaning legislators attempting to move things around in pursuit of social justice. So how can it be, if you emphasize strong economic liberties, you can get that part of the argument, how can you get the second part too? How can you get an account of distributive justice that's compatible with the firmness economic liberties? What's more, those are the two pieces. But let me just tell you the full idea. What I want to do, I want to give an account of social justice that is not just a rival to the familiar left liberal market, social democratic ones. I want to give an account of social justice that is, that is coherent, that is both democratic and coherent, but also, crucially, that is more morally attractive than the familiar social democratic ones. So I want to do it this way democratically, show its coherence, and then most important, in, along with all that, show that it's more attractive, that I guess it's a better account of social justice, a better way to think about social justice than the market democratic way. Okay, how do you do that? How long do I talk? It's 4.30. Twenty-one and a half minutes. So how do you get that? <laughs> You've got twenty-one and a half minutes. <laughs> um, that so how do you get that? Well, here's a line again. Again, doing this, doing this stuff. Out of there, I go for, I reason through, I approach to justice, uh, justice as fairness, which regards the most desired order of society, the one we would choose if we knew that our initial position in it would be determined purely by chance, such as the fact of our being born into a particular family. And on this approach to justice what you know, we call justice as fairness, the idea is that, and it's worth seeing the power of this approach to social justice, the idea is that if you want to know what social order would be appropriate and, and would re respect us in those ways I was described before, we should imagine ourselves evaluating social options um, as though we were, had a kind of veil making us ignorant about various features about ourselves. We wouldn't know who in particular we're going to be. I mean, reason this in some way and get to some account, use this as a kind of device of representation, to get some metric of social justice. Um, does any students in the room know who this is from? John Rawls. <laughs> well, not. Sorry, so it's not John Rawls. It's not John Rawls? No, no, certainly not John Rawls. I mean, there was this guy named John Rawls who said something like this, <laughs> like in the 70s or something like that. This is from way earlier. The namesake of the lecture. I, yeah, yeah this, is, this, is, this is 1942 or so. And Frederick Hayek developed this idea of the original position, the original, original position. Um, in the 40s, and Hayek's idea, he reports it later, but his idea is that, he, his, what he says is that um, he came on this idea, this approach to thinking about the great society, and thinking about the standards of evaluation, in fact, it looks like an external standard of evaluation that can be applied to spontaneous orders in Hayek's view, that he came upon this idea, this way of, this way of thinking about how he could discover what the principles of that standard should be, because of an experience in his personal life, and just very briefly, he was in London during the bombing. Some of you probably know this story. Look at the book and know the story. He was in London during the bombing, and you know, things were bad. He came thinking he might be killed. He started sending letters around about his, who could take his kids, what country would take his kids. He started realizing that, in fact, as he got worse, he himself might very well be killed. Therefore, he wouldn't know where, what his parents, his kids in the life have the advantage of having a, a, a famous economist as the father. He wasn't famous at the time, and no reason to think he would ever become famous, but anyway, he, thought that he'd realize that it could be anyone at all in society. And that started getting him thinking about the general problem of how we should think about this thing. He also says that he went on to think that if you really want to do it right, you need to know, you probably need to thicken the information filter. And he said, you probably want to start thinking about the choosers as being not a father making choices for their son, but something like a party's thought as the kind of head of the, head of the household through generations, not just for your particular kids. You start thickening the information filter in various ways. But on this idea, from Hayek, um, this is the idea, this is the way I reason, and this Hayekian way, um, it's Rawlsian too, obviously, I'm sort of you know, messing it up when I say it's original, but if, if, if Hayek came up with this in 1942, whatever it was, 40, um, then you know it's the original position, which of course renders Rawls' position the unoriginal position. <laughs> and at Brown, right, at Brown, it'd just be an intro, big intro, <laughs> intro class refresher in every fall, which was unit on Hayek right before the unit on Rawls. So they, were, they, were, they learned the OP from Hayek, and then of course they come across the unoriginal for a plane, just to mess with them, mess with my colleagues later on in the next class that they take. But from this way of reasoning, how do we get it now? How can you get the two things I just mentioned 
how do you get a democratic argument for economic liberty? And how do you get this conception of distributive justice that's compatible with um, this account of, of economic liberty? Let me just see, let me tell you how I do it. So first, how a democratic argument for economic liberty. So with economic liberty, I mean, uh, I think of economic liberty as protecting independent economic activities. We can break them out roughly, sort of follow James Nichols and others that are very roughly into liberties of working and liberties of owning. Traditionally, traditionally, uh, classical liberals, or traditionally liberals, um, affirmed what I call a thick conception of economic liberty. That is, they thought there were quite a wide range of, activity, of, of economic activities that should be defended and protected by economic rights. And there was also, they also assigned pretty heavy weight to these economic activities and the importance of the protections to these economic activities. So they had a lot of activities that were thought of as being among the economic liberties, and they gave them pretty heavy weight compared to other concerns. But interestingly, starting, I think it starts with John Stuart Mill, who was a very mixed figure. Starting with John Stuart Mill, a kind of division starts happening within, within liberalism. A liberalism about the importance of private economic liberty. A, divi a division that I think ramifies out, and is actually the key junction point that divides the huge ideological sides of liberalism that we see around us today. And Mill, you know, Mill, as I read him, starts to worry that maybe these activities that people engage in the economic parts of their lives are not intrinsically connected to liberty. So the activity of going out and applying for a job and being rejected. Applying for a job again, being rejected again. Bucking up and applying again, getting the job. But it's at um, Home Depot. And you're there and you're being bossed around by some boss and it's not very pleasant for you. But you stick it out. And now you become sort of a little, a little boss too and you start bossing other people around. And you start moving on, and you start being able to take care of your family. And you can, now you finally get enough foothold and enough resources that you can actually start doing the stuff of living. You can start focusing yourself on the things that are appropriate to human beings. Poetry, art, time with your family, leisure, the things that make us fully human. But Mill worries that all those things I just described, the you is applying and rejecting, being bossed around, all that stuff, aren't intrinsically part of liberty for, in the way that Mill wants liberty, the kind of thing that Mill thinks liberty is. So Mill starts to doubt that economic liberties, that activities in the economic sphere, are as important to freedom and individuality as other domains of activity might be. That idea I see getting picked up you know, informally, but really dramatically, in the work of people like John Maynard Keynes. And some of you may know the sparkling little essay that John Maynard Keynes writes in 1930 called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. Some of you know that essay? It's a, it's a, it's, I think it's a beautiful, it's a, it's a gem. You can find it online if you just Google Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. It's very brief. It's also whatever you think of Keynes, he's a master stylist. The piece is hard to interpret. Is it sarcasm? Is it parody? Is it what is it exactly? But in that piece, I think he reveals something really important. Keynes says quite briefly that he's running, in, he's running in 1930. Things are really bad economically. You know, it's a, down, you know, a downturn. <laughs> you call it. But he says, look, don't worry. Within 100 years, he says, we're going to have grown by roughly uh, eight times. Western economy will grow by roughly eight times. And at that point, by you know, 2030 or say by now, we're probably here now on some measure of growth. By this point of this kind of growth, when the age of abundance has arrived, the economic problem will have been solved. And Keynes says, when the economic problem has been solved, we can finally take a look, an honest look, at these bourgeois virtues, these bourgeois virtues of capitalism and market society, which Keynes has, has hag, have hag ridden us for thousands of years, and we can finally recognize those virtues, saving, scrimping, denying oneself for the future, competing with each other, trying to get your family ahead, give your kids a leg up, get them to do all that stuff, as being the, more, the vices that they always were. And Keynes says, when that age of abundance arrives, we can finally turn ourselves to more agreeable activities, more human activities, activities about deciding together how to live wisely, agreeably, and well, as he says in a nice phrase. And he goes on to say, actually, that people who continue to do those bourgeois things, save, scrimp, be ambitious, all that stuff, they are, they are people who are exhibiting morbid neuroses. And he actually suggests that they should be consigned to mental institutions. <laughs> I don't know what to do with all that. There's also footnotes where he talks about a particularly hard case, which is going to be the Jews, who thinks you're going to keep working. And as I read the footnote, you check it out, too. as I read the footnote, he is saying 
we have to Christianize the Jews to stop this bourgeois stuff. But the point of all that, you know, whatever it is, the point of all that though is that Keynes, like Mill, is part of this tradition that worries that uh, economic growth as an ideal should not be a permanent part of our political hopefulness. That in fact, those activities are not actually part of liberty, the things that are valuable to us primarily instrumentally. And those wide liberties, those thick liberties that the classical liberals talk so much about and we're so happy about really were liberties of a certain ethic, a bourgeois ethic. And so too, finally, more formally, John Rawls, and when he works out his, or writes up, when, when he runs for the original position and develops his argument for, for the basic rights and liberties, I think Rawls is very much working in the same intellectual tradition, at least broadly speaking, about economic liberty and skepticism about growth and openness to the idea of a no growth or stationary state economy that comes from Mill and Keynes. And Rawls, um, in the list, list of basic rights and liberties, includes only two very thin, scalpel down economic liberties. Famously, there's a right to uh, private ownership of non productive property, that is, a right to own personal things, but there's no basic right to ownership of productive property. There's a right to freedom of occupational choice as a, as a basic right and liberty, but it's a very thin and attenuated conception of, the, of, 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 of occupational choice. It does not include, for example, a right to determine for oneself much at all, if anything, about the terms on which one's willing to work, how many hours one's willing to work, at what wage one's willing to accept for work. Those kinds of thicker liberties of working are all going to be consigned to later parts of the theory, and the democratic liberation will decide what we do, what, 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 what rights we assign to people. But there's not be any core basic right about that. My idea is that that's a, that's a mistake. That was a huge mistake that happened within the liberal tradition. And that the people who went that way and sort of had a sort of a disdain for work, people like Keynes looking down his long aristocratic nose at these bourgeois everyday workaday virtues, failed to see the moral importance to people of those activities I was describing before. They failed to see the importance to many people's lives of engaging in exactly those kinds of activities. And one of the resources that really helped me first come to see that vividly was uh, feminist stuff, especially feminist scholarship from the 19th century. There are feminists uh, saw vividly that you could have all the gilded, you could be given and be enjoying all the gilded material means in the world, living in a lovely glass cage or a, uh, a, a, a lovely doll's house, and be given all those wonderful things in the world. But if you're being denied economic liberties, denied liberties in general, but economic liberties in particular, there's some way in which you've been disrespected. And a system, say a patriarchy, that provides those means but denies people those rights to be causes in some sense of their own prosperity or the chance to be involved in defining that, offering themselves in that domain of their lives, treats those people in a bad way, in a way that's objectionable, no matter how nice the cage might be. And so too, so I take that idea from feminism and I take it and I try to turn it against the social democratic ideals. So I think that feminist insight can be turned and trained against um, the social democratic ideals. And more substantively, it just seems to me, and I've worked this out in a bunch of different directions in, in the book, that economic decisions are among the most important decisions that make us adults, or give us the chance to become, to develop our moral powers. In the book, I do it in a more technical way, talking about the requirements of democratic legitimacy <coughs> in terms of expanding our, our horizons of evaluation so that we can become the kind of beings that can give our assent to programs. But the idea, just more simply, is that I think that choices about saving and spending, for example, are among the most important ways that we become, um, that we develop our moral powers. For example, um, a decision about whether to spend money on, uh, this is a trivial example, spend money on, uh, on a flat, to take advantage of the sale of, of flat screen TVs that are on sale, or to save the money for your retirement, that chunk of money. Or the decision to, um, you know, as a parent, to put a second, a bedroom on your house, your child, children can live in separate rooms, or to save the money so that they can, you can afford to send them to college. Those kinds of decisions, interestingly, force us to think hard, maybe distinctively, force us to think hard about the relationship between the person we are now and the person we're going to become in the future, in five years, or in 10 years, or 20 years. Those, that kind of thinking, that kind of reasoning about who we are now, the relationship between us now and our desires now, and the person we're going to be in the future, is, I think, the kind of reason that, that provides a kind of a doorway between adolescence and adulthood. There's a reason why we at teaching universities know and watch college seniors start to change 
and start to become something like adults, when they start facing the question, what am I going to do with a philosophy degree? And it's lovely when they don't think that question, and they're walking as freshmen, and they start doing this great stuff, but there's still something childlike about that. When they start thinking to themselves, what am I going to do, who am I going to be, now they're becoming something broader, something more serious, something more mature. I think that economic decision making uh, is one of the most important domains of human, of human liberty. And so I argue that there's a democratic, from these democratic foundations, I don't understand what they do with your legitimacy, you can get strong arguments for private economic liberty. I also just mentioned as an aside, one of the really striking things I found when I started doing literature searches on this is that um, the arguments in favor that high liberals give in favor of their thin conception of economic liberty are, to borrow a phrase from Lauren Lebowski, uncharacteristically lame. <laughs> if you actually, and they're also very, they're also, also very far and few between. There's hardly any sustained arguments against the democratic conception of, of, of a democratic argument for economic liberty. Why? Because when people want to attack economic liberty, all they have to do is attack Nozick. So you, you, know, you, want, you want to defend economic liberty? Awesome. Bring Nozick in, trash him around, and we taking care of the argument. But, or, or you know, pick your favorite, Hayek, whoever you want, the consequentialist, for example. But, and may as a result of that sort of curious feature of our of the moral status quo, we haven't had people on the left have not been confronted with a serious question. Why not economic liberty? Why not thicker, or from a positively, why thin? Why should we accept this tradition of economic exceptionalism? The tradition which says we're going to take those traditional rights and liberties, and we're going to think of the economic, the economic ones to be minimized and made small. Notice that, by the way. But it's not only the people on the left, the high liberals, who have embarked upon a policy of economic exceptionalism. People on the right, especially the libertarians, have done just the same thing. People like Nozick take the basic rights and liberties that have traditionally been affirmed by liberals, and they too focus on economic liberty. They, don't just, they treat them exceptionally, not just by downgrading them, but by doing the opposite, by elevating them way up. So we get these two groups with these two, I think, extreme views without much common ground to reason about. And that's one of the things that I talk a lot about in the book. Okay, so that's a sketch of that part of the argument. What about the second part? What about an argument for economic liberty? What about an argument for distributive justice? How do you get that? Well, a couple things. You know, one thing, a, a, a classic problem, a basic problem when you think about distributive justice is, well, a question philosophers ask, what is a theory of distributive justice a theory of? Like, what does it apply to? So you have some kind of a device like this, a hacking and Wallstein device, let's say you can succeed in getting it to give out, to generate some sort of more or less determinate standard, a metric that we're going to use now, a metric of social justice, to apply to something. What is it that should be, it should be applied to? So what is distributive, a theory of distributed justice a property of? And one answer, familiar answer, is that it's a property of the distributions in a society at any given moment. Take a snapshot or a time slice in America today, here we are, you know, whatever it might be, right? Oh, I'm sorry, y'all think it's like this, right? Whatever you think, whatever it is, right? And we take the standard and put it on that and say, was it just or unjust? You know, for a lot of reasons, that's not the way most philosophers work on it. And really strikingly, in, um, in a book by Frederick Hayek, Hayek, again, I think a really good guide on this, in volume two of Law, Legislation, and Liberty, a book called The Mirage of Social Justice, on page 100 in a footnote, Hayek says, where he affirms, explicitly affirms social justice, at the end of his most powerful, and I think best, attack on social justice like, as a concept, he ends by affirming the Rawls, you know, a Rawls-like approach. And in that footnote, he cites an early article by Rawls where Rawls says, look, if we think that justice is going to be a property of distributions, then we're going to find that, in fact, the decision procedure is to be hopelessly indeterminate. We'll never be able to get from this, or you know, from a Rawls inversion of this, a metric to apply to that kind of a problem for reasons we can talk about if you want. But the important thing is that Rawls says that in that early article, what that should be, what it should be applied to is something like the basic structure. The basic, even holistically, through time, say from a, across a generation or two, we apply the standard of justice not to actual distributions, but by asking long-term holistic questions about a whole set of norms and a whole set of norms. Well then what, but that's what justice is a property of, not distributions, but something like the, the patterns that we generate through institutions, focusing on the institutions themselves, well, what do we get? You can do this different ways. I'll just do it a simple way for now. I can do it in a slightly more Rawlsy way if you want it in the, in the conversation, in the, in the discussion. 
well, what society is just? What form of distribution is just? You might say it's this one. A society that's, where people are fairly equal is more just than one, which they're very unequal. Especially if some of these people who are very wealthy have their stuff because of undeserved facts about themselves. And they've helped themselves to you know, undeserved elements such as their genetic endowment and their family and they get more stuff. Well, which of these two societies better realizes our commitment to respect every person as having a life lead that's really important, respects the freedom and equality of all citizens? But as I said a minute ago, this standard has to apply not to patterns, but to distributions, institutions viewed holistically through time. And a society which is skeptical about growth, open, for example, to the possibility of a stationary or no stationary state or no growth economy, a society put, fixed on questions about, about redistribution may tend to grow less than one which aims explicitly at growth as an ideal. And even if that <laughs> society now aims at growth as an ideal, um, let's say it becomes more unequal, my fingers are, but imagine my fingers are even longer, so you can generate you know, greater inequality through time. On this approach, we say, well, which society is more fair? And you might think this one, you know, so we're running the Parthenian egalitarian thing, or you might think in a more prioritarian way, and look at my thumbs, right? That maybe we should think about the society that does treat the least, the least of all off best. There's an ambiguity in there, a really important ambiguity, in what it means to benefit the least of all off. And I can talk to you about that if you like in the, in the, in the Q&A. I actually think that the biggest divide between these two approaches to social justice that I'm describing are, are worked down to two pieces. One is a democratic dispute, a reasonable democratic dispute among scholars we're only just beginning to have about the moral importance of private economic liberty. So that's one piece. But there's a second piece I think is just as important, though it's kind of hard to see, because we're only just starting to understand what Rawls is actually up to in this whole area. So there's a real question as to what it means to benefit the least of all off. And I think that what we have this is where we are. We got, in the last century, uh, especially at the end of the last century, some really sophisticated accounts of social justice. And they were stripped up to us, up to us as accounts of social justice. What in fact they were, though, were all, all of them. I mean all of them. They were all actually in one school, one possible school of social justice. A school which um, emphasize, which, which de-emphasizes the importance of private economic liberty. A school which is skeptical of economic growth as a moral ideal in part because there's a kind of commitment here to thinking that people are best respected by the status they have in the workplace more than by the amount of stuff that they have. There's kind of uh, an idea within this tradition that emphasizes something like that, though it's been in Kuwait until very recently. So there's this tradition which has been served up in social justice. Libertarians and classical liberals objecting to this thought they were objecting to that. But my suggestion is that we have the possibility now of what I as the undiscovered country, of a whole development of a whole range of conceptions of social justice that are what I call market democratic, not social democratic. And these theories, if we could attend to them and start working on them, would share these two features. They would take seriously the importance of private economic liberty and take seriously the importance of the idea that we truly wish to respect our fellow citizens. No matter how paternalistic or well-meaning our the, these guys' views were about why they limited economic liberty, there's something fundamentally wrong of preventing people from exercising their liberties by themselves. And second, that if you really want to think about benefiting the poor, we have to think about letting them maximize their ability to decide for themselves what they value. And we should look for structures of ownership and develop a side which, which provides options for ownership structures that empowers ordinary workers to decide for themselves whether they want to work in a democratic workplace, where they would prefer, for example, to work in a workplace which generates higher wages in a wage labor situation. That's what I think respect for people really requires. And I give a particular version of this school just to sort of show that it can be done. I develop in some detail, pretty, pretty careful detail, one example of a market democratic theory that I call free market fairness. But I think it's just one of many that could be developed. I just run that one to shell out to be done. Sort of, I marketize the Rawlsian schema. About, and I, call, I call my view market democracy or free market fairness, um, but some people have been giving it a less formal name, um, which I don't mind, and they call it social justice American style. And I'll leave it with that.
I want to ask a question about Habermas. Um, about Habermas? Yes. Um, so you, you start with a what, what you call your the philosophical anthropology with which you began. Yeah. Is one that, that sees the human being as the, the dialogic, the deliberative, and the democratic being. Um, and so, in, in short, uh, the, the question that I'd like to ask is, um, in, in, a, in a really more Habermasian and more, more pure democratic model, yeah. um, it seems as though the question, uh, <coughs> as you pose it, um, social democratic or, or market democratic might, might not, in fact, arise. Instead, yeah. there would be this sort of, sort of disavowal of any sort of a priori status for, for the intellectual to make these sort of uh, dictates for society. Yeah. And uh, I guess the question that I have is, why why is that sort of uh, philosophical anthropology or understanding of democracy wrong-headed um, on your account? Can I ask you a question, Seth? <laughs> why does the denial of the a priori starting place or vantage point make you think that it's unlikely that what would come out of our Habermasian system would be a division between market democratic and social democratic approaches? I, I, I suppose I don't. Um, so you think that the Habermasian approach, if we ran that, sorry, if we ran, if we went looking, well, yeah, I know what you know, who's, who's going to be looking, but if we, <laughs> if we go Habermasian up top, above that and through, you don't know what's going to come out of it. So then, I mean, I, I, you can probably guess, I, I, I like that a lot, provided that, and I'd, like, I'd like it even more, um, if someone could show that in fact the option B you don't think is going to open, that would open. Is that what you meant? I actually don't want to defend the, the Habermasian view. I, yeah. I was more curious about what your response was yeah. to that sort of objection. Yeah, you know, I haven't really, um, I haven't really gone that way with, with it much. I mean, I've, I've sort of thought, I thought about some of these strands through luck egalitarianism and capabilities approach stuff. And now I'm doing it from the other side. I'm really interested in trying to run them from self-ownership and from some of the more classical liberal foundations. Can you actually get arguments for social justice built in that maintain economic liberty in this way. But I haven't really run it myself to the Habermasian way, but I like the idea. Um, Alan? Well, I'm sure to talk. Um, I guess my question is, um, given, I mean, I agree with you completely that economic liberties are extremely important and have been downplayed in most of the social justice literature. Though interestingly, not really downplayed in international legal human rights. And yeah. As Nichol points out, you mentioned Nichols' discussion. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of interesting that uh, people who have written the UDHR and the major conventions have recognized that economic liberties are important. Yeah. Uh, but they've also included economic rights. Sure. So my question is, sure. to what extent, what sort of economic rights do you think are needed to make economic liberties effective for everybody? I guess yeah. that's one way to think. Yeah, yeah, good. So that's a big, um, a really important feature of the the shift that I'm suggesting. When I see, when I move down to the democratic uh, line, we have the democratic box. I really move down there. So that means that the question, of, and there's a couple of things that happen here. The question, well, what economic liberty should be on the list of basic rights and liberties? Or put a question like this: What per, what part of your does people have, do people have a right to their pre-tax income, or do they not? Or, and if they do, what is it exactly? I think. That any arguments that we have to adjudicate those kinds of arguments by asking questions about self-authorship. I think it's implausible, for example, it seems I'd want to hear the argument, but I think it's implausible to think that an extremely wealthy, extremely wealthy people could say that being subject to, to steeply progressive taxation limits their self-authorship or infringes upon their self-authorship. If it can be shown, then I'm open to saying, as a moral matter, those kinds of ownership taxes are, are, are illegitimate. But the burden, I think, it's tough. It's a pretty tough burden to carry around. And I mention that because what that means is that on this approach, in every case, we're kind of on a continuum now. People who think economic liberty should be uh, taken seriously or not. Um, uh, and, and one of the, there's a symposium this summer on and Bleeding Heart Libertarians on the book. 
with some really good people, Sam, uh, Sam Freeman, but the, the Liz Anderson one in particular, I mean, you saw was really, really interesting. Because Liz Anderson said something similar, similar to what Alan has said a little, at least a bit about economic liberties have been downplayed too much, and she abandons the role as the traditional physician and comes on board the vessel. But then she says, well, if you come on board, it doesn't mean I can become you know, a crazed classical liberal as she thinks I am. I think that's an interesting point. So the question of what economic liberties, whether they should be positive and negative, or what mix of those there should be, is one that on my scheme is genuinely up for discussion. And in the book, I say that if we, I think that if you really take economic liberty seriously, and we think that people, um, that, is, as, that as fellow citizens, committed to respecting one another as responsible and self-authors, who assert, as I assert, that decision-making in the economic realm is an extremely important domain of human liberty, then we should be pretty open to the idea of redistribution to make, make up economic liberty, people's economic liberty substantively valuable. So among the things that I recommend and talk about as a, a real live possibility is something like a guaranteed minimum income, a pretty robust one. If you care about economic liberty, I sort of, I sort of like the Charles Murray proposal on this, so I know controversial care, but the idea that I don't know if you know Murray's proposal, that Charles Murray's a libertarian, his proposal is that we scrap the welfare state and give everyone whatever it is, 1,200 bucks a month on the first of the month. And the way I think of that example, well, you know, we give these people a sign of respect unconditionally no matter what they do. The surfers, the people who take the money and will buy, uh, you know, a, a case of wine and a case of Red Bull and drink them all in the first two days. We don't <laughs> care about that. It's unconditional. The next month we give it to them again. Because why? Why? I think because we want them to join into this experience of market democracy. We say to them again and again, okay, you blew it last month. We're here for you again. Well, how are we here? To tell you this, pay that? No. To tell you we think that your authorship is essentially tied to your economic decision making. You chose Red Bull and Red Wine. Maybe this month you won't. Maybe this month you'll choose, you know, saving, getting a job and getting started, with it, whatever. But we did it again and again. So on this approach, the, what you get out of the end here, I think is actually a really interesting range of options with arguments having to be made in every case to get the way you want to go. And um, you know, one of the things that's been really striking to me giving talks about this is that when I was first giving some talks, um, I was really surprised that people on the left, groups that I thought would be really hostile to, and not the academics, folks well, most <laughs> I'm not worried about it, but sort of public policy groups. I gave an early version of this talk at a group in London called the IPPR, the Institute for Public Policy Research, which is sort of the big new labor group. And I was amazed, and actually at the time kind of dismayed, to find that they actually liked the idea. They liked the idea, I guess, the general idea, because they're trying to hold back old labor, as they call it, right, the, the old guard. So they liked the idea that they could say something like, well, economic liberties are an important part of the you know, post Tony Blair Labor Party. But crucially, when you go this way, you get onto a kind of a continuum. And when you're on the continuum now, you have to argue for economic liberties you know, right by right, domain by domain. And positive liberty and a concern for positive liberty is very much on the table now. You can't be unless you would argue to take it off, which I don't see. Um, please. It's sort of a two-part question. The first part is quick, and that is, do you see this uh, ideal of the person and of the kind of reasoning the ideal person does as a kind of heuristic device for generating principles of distributive justice, or do you see it as, in some sense, in Habermas's view, a way of um, deliberating together? It's sort of an end in itself, in a sense. This is the best form of human life if people embody these kinds of ideals and so on. Heuristic is it, device. Is it simply a, what's that? As a heuristic reason? device. Good. Well, uh, okay. Well, those, those options struck me as a little bit. The the reason the reason I started challenging you before on this, and that is sort of given public choice considerations. You know, mm -hmm. should we really expect democratic citizens to be like this? You had a response to that. Well, Nasty <coughs> though offered really briefly a challenge, and I wanted to sort of expand that. And that is, is this even an ideal that we do we really want people in any way if it's if you don't take the heuristic device option yeah. to be like this? Well, Massey actually sees it as sort of an impoverished world, an impoverished ideal of people, um, that they're constantly sort of obsessed with politics and talking in the public sphere and all of this. Yeah. I think, yeah, division of labor is a much better story where we all sort of do our own thing and once in a while go to the polls. And, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's almost actually a, a dystopian view of human beings on that view. Uh, yeah, what I, do you I, think of To be honest, when Lamar asked that, I didn't really get that, and we sat together at dinner, and I still didn't get it. Yeah. And I'm mean, now, and I'm sure this is strike three for me <laughs> or for his point. But I don't get it still. I mean, if you're going on a fairly orthodox, you know, Rawlsian way, 
right? We're just asking about the possibility of a certain way of living together. And it may be possible, it may not be possible, depending on all kinds of things out there in the world. We're asking about that possibility. Uh, is the question, well, why do we care about that possibility? Because it's going to be dystopic no matter whether it's possible or not. Yeah. Or if it is possible, it's dystopic. So I take it Rawls specifies this ideal sort of citizen as a way of saying, well, here's how we would reason if we were committed to certain principles uh, or a certain procedure to generate principle, right? Nobody's ever going to be like this, and who cares anyway? Yeah. But if we want an ideal set of principles that express justice and fairness, here's how we, here's how we conceive of the person. Right? Yeah. Um, another way of thinking about it is this is how people should live together in society or something like that. And I yeah. take it that second view is the one that Lovasky sees as almost dystopic. Yeah. And I'm, I'm with him on but that. But is that, yeah, again, I'm just, okay. no, 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 I don't mean to be dismissive. I see, I, I see it's a hard, hard area. Yeah, like, to what degree is, is this a political conception of the person that we're, that we're modeling with? Yeah. And if we're modeling with that, does that commit us to some view of what people are really like in the world? I didn't think or so. Or should be. Yeah, I don't think it is either of those things. Okay. I don't think so. I might be wrong. Um, please. Uh, is there any con is there any uh, contractual arrangement or agreement made between uh, so-called consenting adults that your free market fairness would require the state to prescribe, and on what grounds? Are you a tent person? Sorry. Are you a tent person? <laughs> uh, yeah. More probably more of a tent person. <laughs> So sorry. Um, Maybe even a Republican. Smaller. Um, um, uh, you mean are the thing, this like this is a Sandel question? Like what things should not be for sale? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Or is there any? I mean, is there a, a contractual agreement that uh, that the state should be obligated to to not enforce or to to uh, negate? Yeah, I think there's a whole bunch of them. So I think so I just I just like to hear and on what ground. Yeah. So I, when, I, when I think about um, the basic the set of basic rights and liberties and what's on that list and what's not going to be on it, let's say um, in that core set, that's the, one of the constraints on the set is that it has to be uh, it has to work the whole anything that's on this in that list has to be compatible with the other ones on the, on the list too. So they have to work together as a kind of a, a functioning whole. And so if you have liberties on the list that could be if enforced by the state could lead violations of other rights and liberties, then that liberty is not going to be, uh, not be, can't be part of the fully adequate scheme of rights and liberties. So for example, perhaps uh, a candidate might be a slave contract. There might be, you can talk about it in terms of inalienability if you like. I like it better in terms of how does the fully adequate set a scheme of rights and liberties work, work as, as a scheme. Uh, but there can be things that can be in tension with other basic rights and liberties of respect <coughs> from a democratic perspective. The idea is that, I mean, the basic idea is that the economic exceptionalism of the libertarians runs us into a place that I think it seems to be illegitimate on democratic grounds, certainly. Why the, why the priority for democratic, why, sorry, why the priority for economic rights? Why the priority for contract rights? What is it about that aspect, like all the hardcore, um, unmitigated, can do what you want to sort of the nose of ASU? What is that, what justifies that kind of importance being given to economic liberties? I think it's hard to give that argument in democratic terms. So I think there's a whole range of, we can call it an inalienable rights, that economic liberty should not be allowed to protect. Um, and that's one can make out a democratic argument for them. Way in back. Um, thank you very much. It's a great talk. Thank and you. It helps me think through some of the things, um, how I frame my contemporary ideologies for So I really enjoyed the talk. Thanks. My question is actually similar. Is you said a lot about how thinking about people as democratic citizens changes the way we might understand what the state does. And I'm curious if it also should change how we understand what the market should do. I mean, like, I'm thinking about Milton Friedman's argument that corporate boards shouldn't be involved in charitable giving. That's not the market's job. Or like my grandfather was a small town lawyer who sometimes took payment in potatoes, which he didn't really need, but he thought that people couldn't pay otherwise. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if we think of ourselves as democratic citizens <coughs> rather than self-owners or utility seekers, if we should behave differently in the market. Yeah. Um, uh, so the way I, I this will probably be a pretty un unsatisfying answer to that. Mm -hmm. But the way I think about the economic liberties and the question of where the market should go, it always runs through a question for me. It's always a question about uh, moral powers. 
So I ask, well, what domains of activity are domains that um, are domains within which people can reasonably claim that they need to um, develop and exercise moral powers, things that are fundamental to their capacity to evaluate the social structure that they're living within so that they can, at some point, legitimate them, agree that they, in fact, they can affirm them for themselves. So all the particular questions about what things, what a dealer should be able to trade potatoes or, you know, what, those are all, to me, going to be, um, at least on the basic rights and liberties level of the argument, going to be arguments worked out in terms of self, responsible self-authorship. I actually think of the theories are in a couple of different levels. I think you run democratic arguments based on those concerns about legitimacy to get the list of basic rights and liberties, but I suspect that the economic liberties that'll be on that list are gonna be a pretty small, a pretty small number. There'll be lots of other economic questions that need to be decided socially. Those are decided in, in further levels of, of deliberation. I think they can be decided in terms of certain uh, conception of social justice. So I think non-basic economic liberties, rights and liberties, there's hoping to go a whole bunch of them. What tax rates do people pay exactly? Where should the brackets be? You know, what kinds of contracts, what kinds of corporate entities should be recognized for what kinds of purposes?